let's take a look at excavation. Excavation for many archaeologists is the next step after you locate a site that could answer your question or after you do survey in an area. Um, this is a picture looking from the top of a tell uh, down towards the edge or bottom of the tell. And this is what's known as a step trench. I'll talk a little bit more about this. But what you can see are the archaeological layers. And obviously you can see that archaeology is a destructive science. Once you excavate through something uh, and if you made a mistake, you can't just put the soil back in and re-excavate it. You have to work from your notes and photographs and things like that and try to reconstruct what was going on. Uh, in the old days of archaeology, some archaeologists, like we heard about the Heinrich Schliemann, uh, were quite destructive in their uh, excavation. Here you can see this is from Iran. This is the site of Susa. And you can see that they're not really, I mean, it's a really large excavation. You don't see a lot of structures, though. A lot of times in these ancient, uh, sorry, these historic sites, uh, for, you know, like, excavations from the early 1900s late 1800s they dug through a lot of things without recording them this is from uh, the site in turkey that I worked on. and you know it looks disorganized from above view but it's actually very organized each group is in their own area and they're separating the materials that they find from each different context, if you're talking about context, they keep them separate from each other so that they don't get them. So excavation is really uh, almost like a, um, it's almost like a dissection. It's the digging of an archaeological site in a scientific, rigorous way where you are removing the soil called the matrix and recording everything in its uh, context. So we'll be learning more about that. And in this scenario, right, this is a human burial, right? Uh, you would want to excavate this in such a way that all the things that are associated with the burial, such as the animal teeth and the stone tool, are kept associated with that human burial. Right? Uh, in Turkey, here you can see the edge of the tell. We excavated uh, foundations of walls down to floors and we're able to photograph, you can see a mortar here, photograph objects like mortars in place right on top of the floor where they were used. Uh, when things are found in place, we sometimes call this in situ. Right? Um, we're going to be learning about the different kinds of context archaeologically. This is another portion of the site. And what you can see here is the stone floor. And you can see these big, large pot sherds. Uh, a pot was resting right on top of the floor. The roof collapsed and broke open the pot. Sometimes things were intentionally buried, like humans. Uh, this is an archaeology student from Grand Valley, and he's excavating a burial of a teenage girl that was found. And you can see, again, we wanted to leave everything in place for the photographs. Uh, you can see her, the remains of her body, but later um, ancient digging at the site, those people who were living at the site after she was buried dug and into the mound and destroyed some of the bones so we only had you can see her upper torso her head this is a bronze earring that was found with her okay so in the excavation there's several crucial parts there's the matrix this is what you would record as the soil you would want to record the exact location of everything that you find this is known as provenience. So you might say, okay, it was found on these coordinates, X and Y, and it was found this many centimeters below the surface. You also want to record association. Right? So, uh, for example, in the burial uh, here, you would say the bronze earring was found associated with the human remains. Right? The uh, stone pebbles are associated with this burial. Right? All of these things, matrix, provenience, and association, describes archaeological context. 
Now, when you take something out of its context, or when you take it out of an archaeological site, like looters who just dig big holes in sites and pull out pots and artifacts, they're destroying context and association. That destroys the information around that item. And we're going to talk more about that, why looting is such a problem. Because your interpretation of that uh, artifact will change depending on what kind of context you find it in, right? So a stone tool found in a burial gives you one meaning. A stone tool found with animal bones gives you a different context and a different meaning. A stone tool found with other stone tools, and now you've got a, a, a completely different context altogether. So in the first uh, scenario, it's a grave good. In the second scenario, it's found with animal bones, it's a butchery tool. And the, in the third scenario, maybe that co uh, context where you found it was a production area where they produce stone tools. Okay, the best kind of context is known as primary context. It's the context in which something was used initially, left in place. We talked a little bit about uh, Pompeii right? um, and the site of Pompeii. Pompeii an example of Pompeii is, a, is a sort of a good example of primary context because everything was left in place the way it was being used. Pompeii was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. It was buried in volcanic ash, as we talked about before. While uh, archaeologists were excavating the site, they found hollowed out spaces within the ash, poured plaster in those hollowed out spaces, excavated down it turns out that those hollowed spaces were the remains of uh, human bodies and the plaster gave kind of a 3d form to uh, the, the what was left of those human bodies people who seek sought shelter in their houses away from the volcanic ash so they found artifacts in place paintings well preserved everything is left in place that's primary context a, a burial would be another example of primary context. An, uh, a third example of primary context would be finding a tool used in place on the floor exactly where it was left, right? So this is primary context. Now, the next context are one step removed from that. So secondary context um, is once removed from primary context. So let's say you're using this mortar and pestle right? and the mortar and pestle breaks. Well, it's no longer useful. You can't really use it anymore. So what do you do with it? You throw it away. So trash pits are good examples of secondary context, right? It's um, where you're uh, deliberately digging into your site, deliberately let's say throwing something into an abandoned mud brick house that's all secondary context so like we talked about before in the example of excavating a mud brick house everything below the roof on top of the floor that would be primary context all right so uh let's look at we're going to be looking at stratigraphy this week this this these are the stratigraphic layers of an archaeological site all right now here we could see a Roman wall, and here's a Roman floor built up against that wall. Things that would be found right on the floor would be primary context. So let's say the roof collapsed, and things right on the floor, that's primary context. Now above the roof, all those bricks that are falling off and trash thrown in, that's secondary context because that is one step removed from where those things were used. Someone might have used a, a tool or a pot somewhere else, and then they threw it in there as trash. Another example would be something like a trash pit, right? So here we can see um, there's kind of medi a medieval garden soil was running across all the way across here. You can see this and this used to be one level. Then what happened? Then people dug a pit and they threw trash in there. This is secondary context, right? Because it is one step removed from the initial use. Everything that was built though on this floor above it is primary context. Okay, tertiary context is even one more step removed from that. And it's not very good context. 
Primary, secondary contacts are pretty good. Tertiary is not so good. An example of tertiary contacts would be artifacts found inside of mud bricks themselves. To make these mud bricks in this uh, site, people dug into earlier deposits that had artifacts in them. The artifacts in these bricks are not associated with this building because these artifacts actually come from earlier deposits. So you couldn't date this house based on the artifacts in the brick. Right? They are taking ancient soil and they're turning that soil into bricks. That's tertiary context. Maybe a river or rain washing archaeological sediments downstream and those uh, sediments are found later on by an archaeologist. That would be tertiary context, right? So they're disturbed. They're even removed from where people threw stuff away. Okay, so looting is a big problem in archaeology because looting destroys the information. If you just take a stone tool and show it to an archaeologist and say, what can you tell me about it? And you don't know the context, then again, you don't know if it was a grave good or if it was found as a butchery tool or if it was found in a production area. Uh, and so many different areas around the world, unfortunately, have had looting. Uh, so let's look at a couple of areas where looting is a problem, but also, uh, again, sort of some explanations as to why context is so important. So anywhere in the world where there's destabilization, you tend to have looting, especially if you have a combined um, combination of destabilization and uh, a poor economic situation. And people living in that country might feel the need to uh, you know illegally dig archaeological sites and sell those artifacts to you know make ends meet so iraq has had a lot of looting especially since the the, the war in 2003 you can see these are all looters pits right this site looked used to look like this smooth on the top uh archaeo you know uh, these are not archaeology excavations these are all looters just digging big holes to try and find artifacts and it really destroys context and it really messes up the site and so this has happened all across the world this is why archaeologists try and prevent uh, looting one of the things that you're gonna work on this uh, week is a small assignment based on eBay where you're going to uh, look for an item being sold and try and determine if it was legally or illegally excavated. I'll talk more about that. But let me give you an example why context, again, is so important. A uh, very famous site in England called Sutton Hoo. Uh, this was found, uh, this was a burial mound in uh, Sussex, right, um, southern England. And a uh, woman who owned the property called in the local archaeologist to excavate this burial mound. He started to find these nails that indicated that this was an ancient ship burial. Um, other archaeologists got involved, and it turned out that what they had found was a very important Anglo-Saxon burial, similar to a Viking burial, right, burial in a ship. And, of course, the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings are cross-cultural cousins or cultural cousins. They found a... a beautiful helmet, uh, and lots and lots of other kinds of artifacts. This is for uh, a leather purse. This is a, a clasp for a cloak. Right? This important individual, uh, archaeologists now think that this might have been a king, uh, King Redwald, who is an Anglo-Saxon king in the 600s AD, uh, was buried in this ship. All right. Now, why was context important? Because all this stuff was found by archaeologists, so they know it's all from the same burial. If all the material was being sold on, let's say, Sotheby's and Christie's and what have you, and it was all in these different collections, a lot of the context information would be lost, such as the fact that there are Merovingian coins from France and Byzantine bowls found in the site. The fact that they were found in England shows the evidence, you know, is evidence of trade, long distance trade between Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and elsewhere in Europe. And again, if you didn't have the context, you wouldn't be able to say that these Anglo-Saxon kingdoms 
had extensive trading networks. This is a sort of a reconstruction of the helmet. Someone wearing it right outside the burial mound. The helmet is interesting because the helmet, you can see these uh, plaques are on the helmet, are very similar to these pre-Viking helmets from Scandinavia, from, uh, you can see, Sweden. And again, what that shows is cultural context between Scandinavia, right, northern, uh, you know, Denmark, northern Germany, and what became the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, right? So we can see that there's connections between uh, Sutton Hoo in Britain and other parts of Europe and Scandinavia. You wouldn't get that if all that stuff was just looted and sold uh, on the art antiquities market. Another good example, this is a Maya vase that has the name of a Maya city, but it was not found in that city, right? It was actually found in a different city. So the, if, again, if this was being sold, you would, the only thing you'd be able to say about it is it was made in a certain city. And you would assume that it was found in that city. The fact that archaeologists found it in a different city shows, again, trade. The other problem with looting is sometimes you can't tell if something is real or not. There's a lot of forgeries as well. So um, these Cycladic figurines, thousands, uh, you know, I think 1,600 have been found, but only 150 were actually excavated by archaeologists. So this is a big problem because it's hard to authenticate things unless they are excavated by archaeologists. Um, so Mali in Africa has had some problems with looting. Cambodia has had major problems with looting. You can see the face chiseled off of a statue. Some, um, you know, Sites that date to the time period of Angkor Wat in Cambodia have been so looted that some have actually collapsed, uh, which is a, a real problem. Um, and so this is going on all over the world. And also, intentional destruction has happened, as we're going to see uh, in Syria. So you have not just looting, but also uh, intentional destruction. So uh, looting in Syria was going on during... The height of the war the war is still continuing uh, and I think from what I've read there still is looting going on one of the things that you'll be doing this week as well is you'll be doing a remote sensing lab where you look at satellite photos in order to identify if there are looter pits from the satellite photos like you can see here archaeologists who couldn't go into Syria recently have been using satellite photos to try and see if looting has taken place. So the site of Dura Europis, you could see 2012, not much looting. 2014, you can see all of those pockmarks from looters. Okay, looting in a, a famous city called uh, Palmyra, which I'll talk a little bit about because I've been to the city in Syria and it's a pretty amazing site. You might also remember that uh, ISIS destroyed some uh, major archaeological sites in Iraq. They destroyed them deliberately as sort of a cultural uh, cleansing or ethnic cleansing of the area. Palmyra was a oasis city in the middle of the Syrian desert and Queen Zenobia, this famous warrior queen, uh, who is queen of Palmyra, uh, rebelled against the Roman Empire. She eventually lost, um, but Palmyra was an important trading city um, during the time of the Roman Empire. Um, it was a combination culturally of uh, Arab and classical um, cultures and art. So this is a temple to a god, Bel, um, which is similar to Baal uh, in the ancient Semitic religions. So it was an ancient Arab culture but the styles were a combination of Arab styles and Roman Greek styles, right? So you can see wonderful, incredible site. It was uh, an oasis city um, that benefited from its location. It was a stopping point for caravans that were going from east-west across the Syrian desert and trading eventually with the Mediterranean. Right? I visited the site you know, before it was uh, looted, some of those buildings I just showed you were blown up uh, by ISIS, unfortunately. Right? Okay, in the next video, we're going to look at 
laws that are uh, try and prohibit looting and I'll describe a little bit more of the eBay assignment that you guys are going to do.